This is Glow in the Dark Radio. 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 The Science Fiction Podcast with original independent science fiction written and performed by Mike Luoma with music by Kevin McLeod the Vatican Assassin Trilogy and the Adventures of Alibi Jones by Mike Luoma are available in ebook, trade paperback and audiobook wherever you find your books online get links and details at glowinthedarkradio.com This is the Science Fiction Podcast, Glow in the Dark Radio. I'm your host, your writer and reader, Mike Luoma. And we've got part one of chapter 11 of Vatican Ambassador on this episode. Now, I've talked in the past about how, for some reason, I couldn't reasonably break up my chapters when I was writing this, my second novel. And that's my excuse. It was just my second. So, for some reason, I do have these mega long chapters. This one as recorded, is an hour and four minutes. So I'm going to break it up into 21-minute segments, or just about 21 minutes. And this is the first of the three on this episode. NBC, our lead character, former Vatican assassin, now Vatican ambassador, has managed to bring together the actual players who matter as he convenes his peace conference on the move. We're going to join BC as those stubborn bastards arrive at Lunar Prime as we get into part one of chapter 11 of Vatican Ambassador on this episode of Glow in the Dark Radio. I want to thank you if you're a patron and help support the podcast. And if you want to become a patron or learn more about that, just head to Patreon to get the details. Go to patreon.com slash glowinthedarkradio or go to michaelawoma.com or glowinthedarkradio.com And follow the link from there to Patreon. I've got three different levels you can join at. $2 a month, $5 a month, or $10 a month. And that helps support the podcast. Helps me pay for podcasting, for hosting, pay for websites, and the stuff I need to keep this thing going. So thank you. Especially if you've been doing that, if you've been a patron. I do have a handful of folks who have been helping me do this for quite some time. So thank you, thank you. And if you want to become a patron and help support my efforts, much appreciated. Again, the place to do that is patreon.com slash glowinthedarkradio. And once again, thank you to my patrons who do that already. The Vatican Assassin Trilogy 3rd Edition audiobook is now available through Hoopla. There's a little bit of book news. Hoopla now has the full-length audiobook, something like 30 hours long. So if your library uses Hoopla, you can listen to the trilogy in its entirety with your library card. Pretty cool. That's the Vatican Assassin Trilogy, the new third edition. New audiobook as of this year. All together, 30 hours. Available through Hoopla. You can also get it yourself. You can just buy it. It is available as an audiobook through the usual places. Kobo, Walmart, at Chirp. At Libra FM, at Google Play, Binge Books, Storytel, Scribed, Audiobooks.com, Apple, Barnes & Noble, Spotify, Audible.com, all those places carrying the book. The Vatican Assassin Trilogy, 3rd Edition Audiobook. Or oh, another bit of book news, too, because the Vatican Ambassador ebook coupon was so popular last month, I've decided to do another one this month. I don't think I'm going to do this a lot, but... It was successful, so I'm going to mine it one more time. Hit it again. So there's a new Vatican Ambassador ebook coupon for this month. And once again, it's a limited number of redemptions for a limited time. This is only going to last until October 1st. So take advantage. You can just go to the Vatican Ambassador site, the page, on smashwords.com. And the coupon is sitting there. There's also a link in the show notes with the coupon code in the show notes. And if you're just listening and don't want to look at the notes, it's RR88 
RR88U. That's RR88U. And you can find that again at smashwords.com. Just look for Vatican Ambassador or me, Mike Luoma, and you'll find the book. And plug in that code and you'll get it for free. Free ebook. A limited number of redemptions for a limited time. Act on this before October 1st. Take advantage. We'll get into Chapter 11, Part 1 next on Glow in the Dark Radio. The Flash Pulp Podcast. Three to ten minutes of fiction brought to you thrice weekly. Now it's three, three, three apocalypses in one. Yeah! Suffering from tough, stuck-on humans? Well, 20 hellish hours of suffocation in the all-encompassing web of Carwick the Spider God will get them right out. Too many brains lying around? The ravenous mouths surrounding zombie-fighting Ruby will quickly clean those up. Nosy neighbors? Infect them with the murder plague and watch as they dissolve into paranoid maniacs bent on the preemptive assassination of their friends and family. Why stop at one end of the world when you can have all three? You can find them all at flashpulp.com or search for them on iTunes. Now here's Vatican Ambassador, Chapter 11, Part 1, on Glow in the Dark Radio. On the evening of the 12th of February, the stubborn bastards and their ships arrive for the conference on the moon at the same time. The simultaneous appearance of two large entourages sends the LSC into overdrive. BC finds himself wishing he could be in two places at once. I should have called Wentworth, had him make me one of those greeting drones like he has. Damn it, who do I see first? He settles for calling Pope Linus on a secure comm as the NCC ship arrives, from a booth near the port where Ayatollah Salid's ship is likewise approaching. Your Holiness, BC says, greeting Pope Linus. Father Campion, hello. I didn't think I'd hear from you again before we arrived. You are arriving, sir. Welcome to the moon, B.C. says with mock enthusiasm. Why, thank you, father. Does this mean you won't be meeting us? Erg, he's on to me. I'll be meeting you, sir. Just not at the port. My secretary and Father Daycomb are there with an honor guard and a group of parishioners to greet you and show you to the Vatican mission. I'll meet with you there, B.C. tries to explain. So. The Pope lets the silence echo for a while. You're meeting him first, then, aren't you? God, the man sounds like a jealous girlfriend. Well, can't lie. Yes, B.C. says. I worried more about the Ayatollah taking offense than you, sir. I knew you would understand. Huh. Okay, then, Campion. I'll see you at the mission, he says. Clicking off. Okay, he's pissed off. The Pope pissed off I can deal with. Don't know that the Ayatollah would shrug off such a slight. Speaking of... BC leaves the secure comm booth and walks quickly over to the port where the Ayatollah Salid's ship is arriving. Governor Erskine is waiting there as well. Ambassador, she says, inclining her head. Glad to see you're here to greet our guest. I wondered whether you'd be here or greeting your Pope. As you say, he's our guest. It would be impolite not to welcome him properly now, wouldn't it? B.C. says, a little on the defensive. Glad to see you get it, Campion. Impressive, she cracks. The port's airlock doors slide open. Through the doors march several rows of UIN soldiers, two by two. They fan out through the port area, surrounding B.C., the governor, and her accompanying LSC officers. B.C. can't see out past the UIN soldiers for a moment. 
The crowd parts as the Ayatollah Salid appears, commanding attention in his red, brown, and gold robes. His eyes peer out, shining in contrast to his dark tan skin, his face framed by his long graying beard and mustache. He looks around the landing area, and then walks up to B.C. and the governor. Governor Armando Erskine, Ambassador Bernard Campion, I am the Ayatollah Salid. He inclines his head in a subtle nod of a bow. Impressive. He's got real presence in person. Charisma. I'm honored to meet you in person, Ayatollah Salid, B.C. says. I'm Ambassador Bernard Campion. I'm honored to meet you too, Governor Erskine adds. Ayatollah Salid, I am Governor Amanda Erskine. Welcome to Lunar Prime and the Moon. Thank you, Salid says, almost absent-mindedly. He continues looking around, absorbing his surroundings, mastering his personal territory. His gaze comes back to B.C. and Erskine, just as they look at each other, wondering. Okay. I hear the Pope is arriving now, too, at the same time, Salid says sharply snapping their attention back to him. Er, yes, he has, B.C. tries. We have tried to treat you and the pontiff with equal respect, and your entourages are both equally welcome to utilize the resources of Lunar Prime while you are here for the conference, Erskine says formally. This draws a small smile to the lips of Salid. Thank you, he says, with a small bow to Erskine. You are a most gracious host. He turns to B.C. Ambassador, I thank you for the honor of your presence here and now. For seeing the wisdom in greeting myself upon landing, it may not sit well with your employer, Salid says the last with a hint of a snarl. And so I know you've done this on your own, and done me honor. I think it is a good start, eh? Salid's smile returns, larger this time. Phew! Thank you, sir, B.C. says with a small bow to Salid. A short man in L.S.C. garb appears at Erskine's side. One of her assistants, what's his name? Used to work for Edwards, too, if I remember right. His appearance is Erskine's cue. Ayatollah, if you follow me, we'll show you to your accommodations, she says. We followed your requests in preparing your lodgings. I hope they'll suffice. She turns to B.C. Ambassador, I trust we'll see you first thing in the morning? But of course, B.C. says, nodding, appreciating Erskine's giving him his out. The woman has skills. Ayatollah Salid, I shall see you in the morning as well. A new dawn, eh? B.C. tries to engage Salid with hopeful humor. We are on the moon, Ambassador, Salid replies. There's neither dawn nor dusk, and our days here are at best artificial. And we'll not be keeping a Martian day but an Earth day as agreed to, Salid says with simmering intensity. I consider that a concession to us, confirming the primacy of Earth as the home for us all. Our home, denied to us as of now. What kind of can of worms did I... Ah, oh, fuck, he's not done. So, I will see you tomorrow, at our Earth's morning. Salid, finished, turns back to Erskine. Shall we go? he asks. Erskine leads Salid away. B.C. stands and watches as the Ayatollah's entourage passes by. Did that go well or badly? Did he say Earth's morning or Earth's morning? I'm not sure. And now I get to deal with the angry Pope. Off to the mission. Hold on. No way! B.C. once again catches a glimpse of a woman who looks like Nita Bendix, the U.I.N. spy, disappearing with the U.I.N. entourage 
into the spaceport crowd. That was her again. I'm sure of it. That Nita woman. Here in the spaceport. As the UIN arrives, of course. She looked a little different, uh, but it sure looked like her. She's got a lot of nerve showing up again. BC casually tries to follow the woman he saw. He catches another glimpse of her as she turns around. Maybe she felt like she was being followed? She does look just like Nita Bendix. The woman sees BC looking her way, and ducks behind a short man in long robes. The two of them disappear behind a group of UIN underlings moving through the terminal. BC tries to keep following her, but the crowd is too extensive. Ayatollah Salid travels with a large entourage, laden with luggage and travel gear. BC doesn't get far before he reminds himself he has to get back and see to the Pope. The questions ring in his mind as he makes his way back to the mission. How can she keep showing up and disappearing? How does she dare? And why does the UIN dare expose her again after the McIntyre fiasco? BC finds the Pope in his quarters, surrounded by staffers unpacking luggage. BC takes it as a good sign when he's let right in to see the old man. Campion, good, finally, he says grimly. And how is the Ayatollah? Pope Linus asks BC, almost sarcastically. He strikes me as a no-nonsense sort of man, much like yourself, BC says with a bit of a barb. Pope Linus arches an eyebrow and answers. You dare to compare us? The Pope challenges B.C. Oopses. You're both powerful men, both religious leaders. I wasn't trying to be snide or disrespectful, Your Holiness, B.C. says modestly, trying to emphasize the capital H. I see, says Pope Linus. So, he says. Leaving it hanging, B.C. stands, waiting. There's a tense silence. Pope Linus stares at B.C. Finally, B.C. speaks. Yes? Aren't you going to brief me? Pope Linus says. About what? B.C. asks. About what to expect? The Pope says. What's going on? Tell me about this Ayatollah, for example. What can I expect from him? What is he like? After all this time, he finally asks for my analysis? Wonder if he has been reading my reports. Salid is a mullah, a teacher of the law, and is regarded as a holy man by his people, B.C. tells Pope Linus. They call him Ayatollah a Shiite term of respect, though he leads all of the Muslims of the UIN. He commands a great deal of power and respect in the Muslim world. It's a real sign of progress that he's here at all, B.C. notes. I'm afraid he seems to see you, Your Holiness, as an ally of the UTZ at best. A puppet at worst. And he probably doesn't think he needs to deal with you directly on any political matters. Is that so? the Pope says, pondering, quiet. Then why am I here? Why did I need to be here for him to be here? Because you represent his opposite number in at least one regard, B.C. informs the pontiff. You are the NCC's religious head, as he is the UIN's. But he is also the political head of the UIN so he regards Demag as his political equivalent. I think Salid views this as a political conference with religious overtones. You need to be here to witness and be included, but the real give and take will be between the UIN and the UTZ, B.C. says, boiling it down for the Pope. Okay, Linus says. So he is really here to see Demag. Fine. I will still be at the table, and I will not be slighted. Do you hear me, Campion? Pope Linus wags a finger at B.C. One of the Pope's assistants interrupts with a communique for the Pope from the Vatican. The Pope looks over the tablet, 
He okays whatever the communique requests with his thumbprint. Something on the tablet makes the Pope laugh a small laugh. You're not a superstitious man, are you, Campion? Pope Linus asks him. Superstitious? B.C. asks. No, I, I don't think so. Why? Do you know what tomorrow is? Friday, B.C. guesses. The start of our new future? A new beginning. Tomorrow is Friday the 13th, the Pope tells B.C. People used to think it was an unlucky day. Some of them thought the actions of one of my predecessors made it unlucky. <laughs> Great. Cursed by superstition from the outset. Just my bad luck. I'm glad to hear you're not superstitious, the Pope says. As a follower of Jesus Christ, you shouldn't believe any of that poppycock anyway. Yes, sir, B.C. says. Poppycock? I want to see De Mag tonight, the Pope tells him, before tomorrow's proceedings get underway. Please arrange it, won't you? I can try to see if he... B.C. starts. The Pope interrupts him. Thank you, Capion. You'll let me know when we'll meet with De Mag, won't you? B.C. nods. Good, Linus says. He turns his back on B.C. So, it's like that. Fine. Off I go, holy rollin' errand boy. So, Mr. DeMag, let me introduce you to His Holiness, Pope Linus. B.C. sets off to set up the requested meeting. The next three days are a blur for B.C. Meetings upon meetings after more meetings. Pope Linus meets with DeMag. DeMag and the Pope meet with the Ayatollah Salid. Salid and DeMag meet alone, then with their staffs, then with Linus and his staff. B.C. is sometimes involved in the meetings, sometimes left outside the doors to ponder what the three men inside are discussing. Governor Erskine has an undefined role as an objective observer, either involved or excluded, depending on some unspoken agreement between the primaries involved in the talks. Eventually, Erskine's help as a mediator is enlisted, as agreements begin to be hammered out. She's level-headed enough to deal with the large issues and even larger egos. B.C. is glad for Erskine's expertise and help. The grinding monotony of the sessions hurts his head. The meetings grind on, but by Sunday there are some results. B.C. takes one of those results personally. As a goodwill gesture, Pope Linus offered to officially and permanently dismantle the O.P.O., the offer has been accepted and agreed upon by the UIN. Other news coming out of the conference is more positive. Ayatollah Salid and Chairman DeMag commit to a business agreement between the UIN and the UTZ, as the UTZ agrees to assist the UIN with the terraforming of Mars. Salid admits their own terraforming efforts have not been as fruitful as hoped, and says the UIN welcomes the assistance of UTZ technology and know-how. They hash out free trade and free travel and visitation zones around the ruins of Jerusalem and Mecca, and the official reopening of Medina to UIN visitation. Some UIN citizens will even be granted temporary residency to cater to the needs of UIN visitors. Salid and Demag paint the broad strokes. Then the career diplomats take over to hash out the details. At the end of the third day, De Mag and Pope Linus ask Al Salid and the UIN to stop referring to the entire Earth as Mecca. On this point, Salid refuses to budge. The conference grinds to a halt. BC is in on the meeting where the line is drawn. We have, on both sides, agreed to many things, Al Salid observes. But this we cannot agree to. Let us end here for now, this time. We will sign the agreements we have made, but we will not agree to this. Essentially, calling all of Earth Mecca means they want the whole world, Pope Linus observes, for everyone's benefit. When Mecca was destroyed, the entire Earth became Mecca. 
Alcelide says in a simple-as-that tone. We do not desire the whole world. The world belongs to Allah, not to any man. Demag is a considerate man, a good listener, and careful decision-maker. He's about six foot two, gray hair, and medium build. He looks similar to the other CEOs that make up the UTZ Council. A generic business suit. Average UTZ Management Unit Number 3. <laughs> he is pretty average, but it takes someone with an even keel to deal with the Ayatollah. <laughs> and Wentworth, for that matter. I'm sure Wentworth has approved each of these concessions. Oh, he's talking. Yes, we've been more than accommodating, Demag says. If you won't let go of that Earth as Mecca position, there's not much more we can do for now. We'll sign the agreements made so far, Demag promises. But this is a major sticking point, Ayatollah. We won't give up Earth. We won't. He shakes his head. Demag pauses, gathering his thoughts. Al Salid looks on, but does not offer a comment. Look, Demag continues, many of us see that certainly as human beings you have some claim to earth, but not as a political group or as a religious group set on the persecution of others. Well then, Salid says, if that is how you see it, we are both correct. We can go no further for now. Salid stands up from the table. But we have accomplished some things this weekend, have we not? The Ayatollah steps away from his chair. Have the documents sent to me on Mars, and I will sign them into UIN law. Thank you, he says, with a slight bow of his head. He leaves the room, followed by a trail of staffers. I told you it would be the sticking point, Demag says to Erskine, B.C., and Pope Linus. He bundles his belongings together and hands them off to an underling. Make sure they get the documents back to me on my station, he says to B.C. I'll sign them there, he says. Well, it's something, I guess. He leaves the table and the room followed by his staffers. Governor Erskine follows him. That was Vatican Ambassador Chapter 11, Part 1, on Glow in the Dark Radio. Well, the Ayatollah is pretty insistent on that whole Earth as Mecca thing. NBC hopes there's a way to create an understanding and a lasting peace somehow around that concept. Somehow. But for now, he's got some positive developments to celebrate. But what BC doesn't know, and other folks don't know, is that other forces have been at work during his peace conference, and some of them aren't from around here. Everything starts to take a turn for the worse on our next episode. Again, a little bit of book news. The Vatican Assassin Trilogy audiobook is available now through Hoopla, so you can use your library card and get the entire Vatican Assassin Trilogy as an audiobook, 30 plus hours through Hoopla, if your library uses Hoopla. And since the Vatican Ambassador ebook coupon was so popular last month, I've created a new one for the month of September. So during the month of September, you can head to smashwords.com, look for Vatican Ambassador, and get the ebook for free with the coupon code RR88U. And that code is right there on the page if you go to smashwords.com and look for Vatican Ambassador or me, Mike Luoma. And that is all for this time around. We've got two more parts to this big long chapter to get to over the next couple of weeks, so I hope you'll be back for part two of chapter 11 on our next episode. I'm your writer and reader, your host, Mike Luoma. Thank you again for listening to Glow in the Dark Radio. Glow in the 
glow in the dark radio 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 This podcast presentation is copyright 2023 by Michael F. Luoma and is protected under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License CC by NCND 4.0 Music by Kevin McLeod You can find his work at Incompetech.com Mike's books are available in ebook, paperback, and audiobook, wherever you find books online. Get links and more details at glowinthedarkradio.com and mikeluoma.com. This has been a presentation of Glow in the Dark Radio.